during the course of my research, I noticed that people often use the terms human trafficking and human smuggling interchangeably. And this is an issue because without understanding the difference between the two, it would be hard to develop a policy that properly cracks down on human smuggling in Pakistan. Human trafficking is a non-consensual activity. By that, I mean there is no element of choice involved. Activities like bonded labor and sexual exploitation are examples of human trafficking. Bonded labor is an activity where an individual owes somebody debt, but they're unable to repay that debt. So they are forced into labor up until the time that they are fully able to pay off the debt through their labor. Hence, it's forced and there is no element of choice involved. Similarly, sexual exploitation is profiting from the use of someone else's body in a sexual manner. Again, this is a forced activity. It's well documented in Pakistan and there is no element of choice involved. Human smuggling, on the other hand, is a consensual activity or traditionally considered to be a, a, a consensual activity whereby an individual approaches someone who can facilitate their cross-border illegal cross-border movement into another country uh, they pay them pay this agent a particular fee and the agent provides them with a service the service being that of human smuggling so the initial act of approaching the agent is done by the individual themselves without force or coercion or at least that's what the notion is traditionally so human smuggling versus human trafficking the best way to understand this would be one is a consensual activity and involves transnational movement of individuals uh, in an illegal manner and human trafficking is a non-consensual activity which involves the use of force and exploitation uh, there are three popular routes that i have covered and primarily the smuggling is being done through these three routes by far the most popular route is the land-based route through balochistan into iran from there into Turkey and then across the Mediterranean Sea into Europe. So the way this would work, say somebody in central Punjab approaches an agent, the agent transports them across Pakistan. I will explain later how that is done. They reach the border between uh, Balochistan and Iran. From there, they are transported through the Mashkel Mountains into Iran. This is usually a three or four days trek, which from my interviews with the migrants is a, a very gruesome journey. Once they reach Iran, they are transported through uh, trucks, buses, uh, even sedans. Um, and they are taken to the Turkish border. From the Turkish border, either the journey ends there, the responsibility of the agents end, or if the migrants have paid enough money, then they are facilitated uh, across the Mediterranean Sea into Europe as well. If you might remember last year in June, there was a fishing boat disaster in the Mediterranean Sea, which was exactly this. Uh, a few migrants from Pakistan had uh, left through the land-based route from uh, Balochistan into Iran and Turkey, and they were crossing the strait, which is um, about 100 120 kilometers straight from Turkey into the southern coast of Greece and just 80 kilometers of the southern coast of Greece their fishing boat uh, uh, capsized killing uh, about 400 to 450 people on board including hundreds of Pakistanis this is the land-based route the second route which happens to be less risky but more expensive is through Gwadar so migrants would uh, reach Gwadar and from Gwadar they would go through the Arabian Sea into Iran from Iran they would go into Turkey and then through the Mediterranean Sea into Europe. What part in Europe is Greece, but Italy is also uh, popular. The third route is the least risky. In, in uh, this particular option, the migrants would get a legal visa. They would fly to Dubai. From Dubai, they would be transported e e through Libya into Europe or through Turkey, then into Europe. This can cost upwards of 10 lakhs, but are unaware or do not have enough information or just want to leave the country through hook and crook, uh, no matter what. The reasons for why migrants leave the country are what is known in this particular field as the push factors. Push factors are the reasons that are, that, that are inherent in Pakistan that become the reason for why migrants are pushed out of the country. This can be contrasted with pull factors, which are those factors in the destination country which compel the migrants to leave the country and go to their destination country. Why? Because the destination country is pulling them towards them. So I'll, I'll explain both. By far the most popular push factors are depth 
deprivation, poverty, and unemployment. In, uh, this should not come as a surprise to anyone, but interestingly, during my research, it was also revealed that traditional notions of masculinity also become a factor. Uh, I was interviewing a few victims and they used to tell me that they are now grown, they have to provide for their family or they have certain needs and those needs cannot be fulfilled from within Pakistan. So the only option they have left is to leave the country. So that's there as well. A popular pull factor is relative deprivation as opposed to absolute deprivation. An absolute deprivation would be Pakistan is a deprived country and hence we must leave. Relative deprivation is yes, Pakistan is deprived but and we are deprived along with it. But if we were to leave Pakistan and go to some other country, we would be less deprived. This is relative deprivation and this came up time and time again during my research. The victims would tell me that um, I, would, I would ask them, why did you choose to go to Europe or why did you choose to go to Turkey? What was the reason? And they used to tell me, it's much better there. It's much better in Europe. We have family there who've gone through the same illegal route and they phone us, they send us pictures and they tell us that it's much better there. So that's why we choose to leave. Relative deprivation also ends up being a very prominent factor for why people choose to leave. So this is interesting. Uh, the human smuggling network works like any other syndicated crime network. Uh, and by that, I mean, they have excellent division of labor. The human smuggling network is a series of sub networks and each sub network is comprised of agents and sub agents. Now this but each particular sub network is responsible for their own territory and not for the territory of any other sub network. By this I mean say a particular migrant approaches an agent in Mandi Bahauddin. From there the agent in Mandi, Mandi Bahauddin registers them, facilitates their transport on to Multan. Multan comprises of another sub network which, with its own agents and sub agents. These agents and sub agents not only recruit more illegal migrants but also facilitate the onward transportation of those migrants who can, who uh, started their journey back in Mandi Bahauddin. From Multan, they are transported over to the sub network of Quetta. From Quetta, they are transported over to the sub network in Iran. From Iran into Turkey. From Turkey, there's a separate sub network that facilitates uh, a movement across the Mediterranean into Europe and inside Europe there's another sub network all of these agents are connected they're constantly in contact with each other they share the information names and details of each and every migrant that has th that is using their service to across uh, the border illegally it's it's to my surprise it's extremely organized and uh, hierarchical as well so uh, uh, under our domestic anti human smuggling legislation Federal Investigation Agency, FIA, is the law enforcement agency designated to crack down on the issue of human smuggling in Pakistan. Human smuggling is a transnational, highly organized and huge network in Pakistan. Activities of this nature cannot take place without the awareness and the knowledge of law enforcement agencies that are specifically designated under law to crack down on them. The only way they would be able to operate, the, the networks would be able to operate with with impunity is if the law enforcement agencies choose to look the other way, which they do. And uh, I looked at international jurisdictions as well, uh, specifically African countries where uh, the land based route from some African countries like Somalia and Kenya over into South Africa and beyond is very popular. There also, it has been noticed the only reason these networks are able to expand and operate on the level that they do is because the law enforcement agencies over there that are responsible to crack down on, on human smuggling don't do so or uh, let the networks and agents operate with impunity. Uh, so uh, I should also add here and I will I will further elaborate this in reforms as well. When the incident last year in June happened, Prime Minister at the time announced a nationwide crackdown on human smuggling networks in Pakistan. Within days, a, uh, agents, sub-agents uh, and people who were running the human smuggling rings were rounded up, apprehended and they were prosecuted. Uh, but this happened for only like a month or so. As soon as national attention on this issue waned, FIA stopped rounding up these agents. And since then, there has been no news of an organized crackdown on these networks. So it just goes to show that if they want to, they can uh, uh, properly crack down on them, but they choose not to do so. The When I was describing human trafficking versus human smuggling, I explained
explained that one is considered to be a consensual activity and the other is considered to be a non-consensual activity. While that is technically true, it is important to uh, snap out of uh, this line of thinking because it prevents a certain level of empathy from going towards people who opt for these illegal and dangerous journeys. When I was talking to the victims, they would tell me time and time again, over and over, that they were left with no choice but to leave the country. They were left with no choice. When they are telling you that they were left with no choice, we are no one to judge them because Pakistan for some reason is part of a huge human smuggling network that goes from Balochistan, Iran, Turkey and into Europe. But on this particular issue, there is no international cooperation. Even African countries where the land-based route to South Africa and sometimes further into the US as well, they cooperate with each other so that uh, they are able to better crack down on on this racket, which happens to be really thriving in uh, in African countries. We should do the same. There has to be a certain level of cooperation between Iran, Turkey, and those European countries such as Greece and Italy, which happen to be popular landing or destination spots for these migrants. Without doing this, without doing this, a transnational uh, criminal activity cannot be properly stopped without cooperating with those countries that are part of the network.